Okay, so get yourself settled and we'll go ahead and start. And again, thinking about the Heart Sutra as it's recited, really trying to connect with the deepest meaning. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked at the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom. He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, um, Additional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, a bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. And so sitting with that, 
Okay. So I um, hope everybody's doing okay. I'm glad that you're back in load. That must mean that things are a little bit, a little bit calmer. And um, hopefully it helps us all reprioritize the important things in life and um, kind of how the trouble happens to begin with and what our role might be in helping to dispel it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that fourfold analysis today. And I think that the most important part is to understand the object of negation. And I think the object of negation is probably the clearest part. But um, if you were to summarize just that one point, not, not the other four, or not the other three, but that first one, what is the object of negation? And how do you find it? Um, which one? Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. How, how do you find it, even though it's not there? How do you find it? When we are upset or uh, feel something bad. Yep. <laughs> something strong. Yep. Um, also, when things are too good, <laughs> right? Uh, when someone uh, maybe floods you with praise right? It says, you're so amazing. You're so wonderful. There's never been anyone like you. You're the star of the world. If they say something amazing to you also, the I will arise. Yeah, not just uh, negative. So the problem is, is that we usually believe, right? The object of negation appears to our mind as the self. It appears to the mind as the personality, as the identity, as the true one that needs protection right? That's how it appears to us. And that's the one that isn't there at all, right? There is a self, but not that one. So um, it's very important that we understand the object of negation intellectually. So then bring it into the experience of our everyday life of why do we get triggered? You know, why do we feel confronted? Who is it that's being supported or not supported? Who's being attacked? or not attacked? Who is the peaceful one or the violent one? Who is it the one that feels like the one? Yourself as an individual, in which days are it more, you know, prominent and emphasized in your experience? And what is the relationship between that and how you interact with the world? So it's a very important question to have for yourself because it can feel sometimes like when you're most yourself, that's also when you're the most grounded and the most effective and the most articulate and able to, I don't know, bring things together or have competency, right? Because sometimes we marry the feeling of being grounded and centered and peaceful with excessive emphasis on identity, personality, and false self, as if they're the one thing. And you can be completely grounded and very much yourself without identifying with the self. Yeah, and that's the very crucial distinction. So, you know, you kind of land on, all right, I get the idea of this object of negation. Now, how do I actually find it? And you find it, you know, in some memory of yours. And once you've found it, you ask questions of it. You ask it to prove itself. And the way that you ask it to prove itself has to be very delicate. Otherwise, it will run away and kind of poof, like you never had that problem to begin with. And you can fool yourself into thinking, sure, I have an identity, but I don't identify with it. Sure, I have a personality, but I'm not personified because of it. And you can sort of trick yourself into thinking you get it. So that's why when you find it, you don't want to destroy or dispel right away. You want to just kind of let it feel comfortable and say, okay, you, if you're true, I should be able to find you. No problem. I'm not saying you're not true. 
you must be true because you're such a dominant part of my experience. So you're either one with the parts or you're separate from the parts, right? Those are the only two ways that make sense for you to exist because we all acknowledge we have parts. We all acknowledge we have context and history and causes and conditions. You don't have to be Buddhist, right? That just makes sense. We all are made up of components. So is the self those components or is the self something separate from those components? Because it could only be one of those two options. Does that premise make sense to you that if the self were to inherently exist, that's the only two relationships? Can you think of a different relationship with the self and its parts or the self and its aggregates? The, the premise makes sense? There's the mind-body problem in the Western uh, philosophy. So uh, one direction is like uh, materialism. Yes. The aggregate, uh, the soul, the mind is uh, the same or come from them. And one is dualism, right? Mind are separate. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, we're not even challenging the inherently existent self. We're just saying, sure, let's pretend that's the case. Let's look at the both two ways, you know? Let's just look at those two different ways and see. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at one with and separate from, or the same as, or different to, there's a very simple way of touching it, and then there's kind of a more elaborate way of really stretching your mind's analytical ability to kind of check and see how illogical our everyday worldview about our identity is. So, you know, I put a lot of, uh, you know, clips and random bits of pop culture for you to sort of explore and play with. It's not that important for you to know which analogy goes with which premise or how it all fits together in a too precise way. Just try and stay with the simple one and make it experiential. Um, there's another text that explains the fourfold analysis. Um, last week, I read from Emptiness from Geshe Tashi Sering, and Ultimate Truth and Relative Truth also has some stuff about it. Today, I want to read from Chudan Rinpoche. Um, and yeah. And hey, <laughs> um, and Chudan Rinpoche's book, um, he does a summary of the fourfold analysis without kind of being so bullet point about it. He kind of just describes the whole idea in a nice summary. And um, he was one of my greatest teachers. He died a few years ago and he lived in a cave, not in a cave, he lived in a room as if it were a cave during the Chinese occupation. And I think his life story is really interesting because when the Chinese invaded in 1959, he just went to his family house or our family's house and did retreat in a room wearing lay clothes, having no pictures of any Buddhas, having no texts, just his prayer beads hidden in a pocket. And he ret did retreat like that for 18 years. And he almost never left the house and he just retreated and retreated and retreated until it was safe for him to get to India and go back to the monastery. And, you know, it, that's, it's an incredibly simple, quiet life that he led during those 18 years. And then when he went to teach, he just had this expansive, spacious way of explaining things. And, you know, he wasn't... Uh, suffering from all the isolation. He wasn't a shut-in, he wasn't agoraphobic. You know, he, he had actually gone incredibly deep with his practice during those years of chaos and he didn't let the occupation rattle his mind. So, um, so he's a very cool teacher. If you ever see books by His Eminence, Chud and Rinpoche, they're usually very clear. Um, so we're just gonna look a little bit at his summary. And I wanted to remind you of something that you already know which is this verse from the three principal aspects of the path, which is what we did our retreat on a couple years ago, just this verse. So without the wisdom realizing ultimate reality, 
even though you have generated renunciation and the mind of enlightenment, you cannot cut the root cause of circling. Therefore, attempt the method to realize dependent arising. So don't lose the point of all this, right? You can have a very good disillusionment with samsara. You can really be convinced that cyclic existence is, you know, deceptive. You can have an incredibly good heart and be an incredibly kind, altruistic person working for the welfare of sentient beings. But with those two, you cannot cut the underlying cause of why you have a mistaken appearance, mistaken beliefs, and then mistaken actions of body, speech, and mind. To stop having the mistake, you need the wisdom realizing ultimate reality, which is emptiness. To access emptiness, you have to realize dependent arising. So if you're ever kind of getting lost in what is all of this about, keep remembering this verse. So I'll let you read it in a minute in uh, Hebrew, if that helps. I wanted to ask about the thing you started before, about the self isn't uh, equal to the parts or separate from the parts. Yeah, I'm going to do a summary right now. And then after I do the summary, if you still have the question, please ask. So I'm going to do a summary really quickly and then, um, and then see what your hanging doubts are. So don't lose your question. <laughs> okay, so this is from Chudan Rinpoche, who I was just talking about. And he was saying basically, you know, the label appears to our mind as something that can be found from its own side. It is grasped as existing in this way. And when we search for the object that is conventionally imputed, we say that it is something that can be found. Therefore, what we negate is that object, conventionally imputed and graphs as existing in this way, findable when we search for it. Once this has been identified, it must be negated. So this is really describing that first step is this sense of the self being findable. We get the sense of the self being findable, the inherent self being findable. Once you find it and identify it, you negate it. So in terms of self-grasping, there are two types. There's grasping at the self of a person that grasps the person as truly existing and grasping at the self of phenomena that grasps the aggregates to be truly existing. And what we call a person is the individual I, and its basis of designation is form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness. And these are the five aggregates upon which the I is imputed through labeling. And subsequently, we think I, me, right? So we label, and then we think I, right? And these five aggregates, are not the whole list, right? The five aggregates all have aggregates, meaning pieces or components or piles, right? The form aggregate, the body has all sorts of parts. Feeling has all sorts of parts. Discrimination has all sorts of parts. We're just using this as our main platform for investigation. So the eye that appears to our mind as something that does not rely upon anything, such as the aggregates, that constitute, constitute its basis of designation and so on, existing as it appears to the mind is the object of negation, right? Because how it appears to the mind is inherent, right? That's how it seems to us. So that's the object of negation. That grasping which remains grasping at the eye to exist without relying on the aggregates at all is called the grasping at the self of the person. A person that is self-sufficient without depending on the aggregates does not exist. The mind of the practitioner who realizes that this does not exist is called the mind realizing the selflessness of the person. So when we say realizing the selflessness, we mean realizing the emptiness, realizing the lack of inherent existence, realizing the suchness. Those are all synonyms 
And that's why we don't like it when you use the word selfless to describe altruistic, if you're talking about Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, when we're talking about selfless or selflessness, we're talking about emptiness in that context. So they get all mixed together um, if you're not careful about context. So here's our example, right, that Jin Rinpoche is giving us. The example is a, a fully ordained monk, some fully ordained monk, any fully ordained monk. He's imputed independence on his basis, like everything else. Therefore, if there were a monk who existed without relying on his aggregates and so forth, then that monk would have to be findable, even after removing each of his aggregates of form, consciousness, feeling, discrimination, and compositional factors. But he's not findable in that way, right? So now you're starting to look at this other angle. If there were something there from its own side, you could take away each aggregate and still that monk would be there. Yeah, but is there a monk without his body? Is there a monk without his consciousness, without his feelings and discrimination and compositional factors? No, you take away the aggregates, you take away the monk. Nevertheless, according to the mode of grasping of self-grasping, when something is established from its own side, it must be findable from within its basis of designation. So then in this way, we should be able to find the monk in what is left after having cleared away the five aggregates that are his basis of designation. So obviously that's not the case, but when we're having conflict, it seems like there's an extra additional component. So then alternatively, we should be able to find the monk in the aggregate of form that is part of the basis of designation. If that aggregate of form, the body, were the monk, then when fire burns that aggregate, when they get cremated at death, the monk should become non-existent. However, we do not assert that a single aggregate is the monk, since after the death of the monk must carry on to the next rebirth. And since that form aggregate cannot carry on in the next rebirth, we do not assert that the form aggregate is the person. Similarly with all the other aggregates. This is because then there would be many consciousnesses in the continuum of one person. And the consequence or result of that would be that one person would become many and so forth. The way it appears to us is that the I that is in merely imputed is findable after clearing away the aggregates that are the basis of designation. And that the I that is the object imputed through labeling is established from within the basis of designation or imputation. So this is also part of the basis, the object of negation, right? It's not separate from, and it's not within or tangled up amongst. So we should keep that in mind and search to see whether there is something findable in the aggregates. Having considered that there is no I that does not rely on anything else, when a mere absence appears to the mind, it is known as the realization of the selflessness of the person. A mere absence, right? So people are always asking when you realize emptiness, what do you see? What appears to your mind? What's the sense you have? And it's a mere absence or a negation. You know, if the mind is having some sort of I don't know, image of some kind appear to the mind. It's, you know, the clear light mind of death kind of fundamental mind appearance of like radiant blue dawn. But really it's just a mere negation, which is difficult for us to get our mind around and can sound kind of scary and close to nihilism. But we're remembering that this absence is like a spacious place of infinite possibility that it's energetic, it's full of possibilities. It's not just like a dry, empty hole. So then when the mere absence appears, the only thing that we realize is that the I does not exist as it is grasped by the self-grasping of the person. 
right? That it does not exist in that way. It is not that we realize that the I is non-existent. At that time, having made the distinction between these two, we realize that the conventional I, that is the I that is merely imputed upon the aggregates, does exist. We also realize that the I that is established from its own side, without relying on the aggregates, does not exist. It is very important to make the distinction between that and the I that is merely imputed. Justin, can you explain again what is the mere absence? A mere absence means nothing is implied in its place. Right? Nothing's implied in its place. So there's lack of elephant in your room. That doesn't imply that there's then a giraffe there. It's just there's the absence of elephant in that room, right? It's the mere absence. So you're able to observe mere absence of elephant in the room only because you understand what an elephant is, right? You wouldn't be able to tell otherwise. So when we say mere absence, instead of just absence, we're trying to really reinforce the fact that nothing is implied in its place, which isn't to say that nothing is there, just not that thing. Yeah, so just, you know, change elephant for I or self, and you start to get it. So this, this one with business, okay, so just here's the short, easy explanation, one with the aggregates, do you guys see that? It's just the self being the same thing as the aggregates or merged together with them. So you're saying that the self is body, the self is feeling, the self is each of those things merged, right? And then that's problematic, right? So you say, okay, that seems valid from a distance. That seems reasonable from a distance. That seems kind of like my experience. What's the problem with thinking about that? And so then you look at the lack of oneness, sameness of the I and the aggregates. So the problems, the problems would be, then the self would have to be one with together with each aggregate or the same as them. Labeling I would be superfluous. It would be unnecessary. It would be extra. There would be no point because it would simply be another name for the aggregates. Another problem is that then together with each aggregate, there would also be an I, and therefore there would be like multiple selves, right? And then here's the fallacy, right? So this is why this clip is perfect because it's really showing how ridiculous it would be, right? It's like everyone in our life would be ourselves reflected in everything, even the menu, right? Even the sounds that we hear. Right, so it's, it's a ridiculous premise, and yet before we examine it, it really feels like it's the case. Okay, so, so just with that one, just with one with or the same as, do you see why that's a, an appearance we have? And also why that's not true, how that's not logical? It's like then there would be some sort of fundamental autonomy also. Each of the aggregates could kind of like do its own thing unrelated to each other. You know, which sometimes it feels a little bit like that, like your body could be uncomfortable, but your mind could be happy, or your mind could be uncomfortable, but your body could be unhappy. That, that happens sometimes, right? But it would be more extreme than that. It's like your discrimination would be reading a book, and then your feeling would be associated with something that happened 10 years ago, and then your body would be in a whole different part of the room than where your eye consciousness was looking, and it's like they could disperse. You know, the aggregates could all kind of go rogue, right? Yeah, or they'd be like, you know, a herd of horses or a school of fish, and, you know, they'd be sort of lumped together, but each have their own personality. Multiple selves, does it make sense? Yeah. That in psychology, where there are theories that talk about multiple selves. And for 
Multiple selves, not like dissociative identity disorder, but like just generally speaking, we have different personas. Yeah, yeah, totally. And yeah, and that's true. That's quite true. But the, the thing is, is that all of these personas and, you know, who you are at home as opposed to who you are professionally, as opposed to who you are with your friends from high school, they can be quite distinct kind of personalities without you being, you know, mentally ill. But that's still very surface, right? That's not even touching the core sense of I that is the problem. It's like, that's still just symptoms of that. You know, the way in which we might really identify with some aspect of the, of the parts as being more important than some other part. I think, you know, the important thing is to ask ourselves, what do we give ourselves like a brand or like a defining characteristic? You know, if you think of yourself objectively, what do your friends and family say is a defining characteristic? You know, hopefully that you're kind and a good listener. <laughs> you know, you probably all have that defining characteristic, a kind, good listener. But, you know, you also might be short-tempered or you might be, you know, short <laughs> or tall, right? Defining characteristic. And those defining characteristics are there. They're quite true. And they're part of what the self is labeled on, but they're still very surface parts. They're not even getting to the aggregates. They're all kind of manifestations of the aggregates. It's like, what does your aggregate of discrimination do when you're professional mode? What does that aggregate do when you're at home? You know, how does it label things when you're this person or that person? And so, Maybe one way of looking at this one with reasoning would be to think all of those personas would have independence. And that doesn't make sense. They are related. It's all part of the same mess. You know, even if they look quite different, if someone was to follow you around and do a documentary, <laughs> I'll look at you at home. You're so different than you at work. You know, there's a relationship. You know that there's, you know, kind of a habit trend or a continuity. But from the distance, it might really appear like those are distinct selves. And then if you have some really serious trauma and you have something like dissociative identity disorder, right, multiple personalities, it's like those facets then become unaware of each other and they do start to operate somewhat autonomously. And it might start to feel like there are multiple selves within one body. And to believe that that's literally true would be too far, wouldn't it? You know, it's all part of the same person, but the experience might be quite distinct. It's, it's an interesting one to sit with from a lot of angles because it does sometimes feel like um, either we're completely in charge or we're not in charge at all when it's kind of somewhere in the middle, you know? So, so when it doesn't feel like we're in charge at all, it could kind of feel like your feelings are off doing something that you have no control over and that you're looking and focusing on something that you have no control of. And you're deciding this and deciding that, but it's not really from free will, it's just autopilot, you know? It can feel that way. And then some days it can feel like I've decided everything about my day. I have created my day start to finish and I am the boss of everything in the world. You know, I'm the master of my universe, right? So both are an exaggeration and both are problematic if you believe it. Then the other, the other one is the separate from, right? The self being completely different than the aggregates, something exclusively other and unrelated or maybe somewhat related. And this is closer to how many religions view the soul, right? They, they view the soul or the Atman as a self that is inherently existent, that exists from its own side, and then has aggregates and parts and components that change. You know, it's like, sure, sure, things change. I get experiences, I learn things, but there's still a core. Um, and I'm in charge of, everything that happens from me. 
And so if that were the case, the aggregates would not rely, right? They wouldn't rely. There would be autonomy. The experience of the self would be unrelated to the experience of the aggregates or could be unrelated to the experience of the aggregates sometimes in some context. Or the self would be like a findable sixth aggregate or boss aggregate in charge of the others. Yeah, so then it's like, here's the self, the puppeteer, and here's the aggregate, the puppets, you know? And this can really feel like it's the case sometimes. Like you're, you know, just pulling strings and just making things happen. So when you look at this one, it's this idea that there's a findable sixth aggregate or boss aggregate that we want to challenge. And this is why when we do the reflection on the levels of dependent arising and we look at mere designation on a valid basis, sometimes we then pivot and look at minds and mental factors. Because what feels like the boss aggregate is usually one of the five omnipresent mental factors. Remember from minds and mental factors, there was all those lists of the different categorizations, but there are some mental factors that are always present, right? And the ones that are always present take turns seeming dominant. And when they seem dominant and in charge, then they start to get a characteristic of like independence that they don't have. So it doesn't even matter which one seems to be the dominant one, but usually for us, it's either how we're labeling things and discerning things, right? So it's discrimination, recognition, or it's feeling. Yeah, which are two of the aggregates also, right? So the omnipresent mental factors and the five aggregates, there's some crossover. So usually it feels like if you think, who am I right now in this moment? Who's in charge? It's the describer, the labeler, the opinion maker, the one that's able to discern this from that. That's who feels like is in charge, right? Or feeling, right? And maybe different times of your life, one was more habitually the case. Maybe sometimes it feels like intention is the boss, right? Where your mind moves towards, what your mind moves away from, and then the choices you make on that basis. Yeah, the chooser. So none of those are independent, but they do exist, right? They exist, they're just not the boss, but they feel like they're the boss and then it feels like you've found the core. And you know, it takes two seconds of reflection to see how any one of those is related to all the rest of them and is related to the outside world and is related to history and context, et cetera. How you feel right now is not just about right now. You already know that, right? But before you think about it, you might think I am very grumpy because I am in this class, <laughs> or I'm very happy because I'm in this class. But of course there's a relationship to what happened earlier in the day what happened in this class in previous days, what happened in this country in previous days, karma, right? But in the moment, doesn't it feel kind of like feeling what you're feeling is inevitable? You know, like it's the thing that has to happen right now and it's a driving component. And then some of us aren't particularly identified with our feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, physically, or pleasant, unpleasant, neutral mentally. We're not particularly identified. We just know that they're there, but we're actually feel like the self is the chooser. You know, I'm gonna choose to be awake and attentive and listen well, or I'm gonna choose to disassociate and look out the window and think about breakfast. I'm gonna choose this or choose that. That's how we identify is our kind of like free will independent intention. And then you realize that that is related to how you're feeling, is related to what you're describing to yourself, is related to what you've been focusing on, is related to karma and history and context, etc. So you just kind of cycle through the different parts of the mind 
let them feel like one is in charge and then see how they're all related to everything else. And what you start to get is kind of a sense of everything dissolving into pieces, not dissolving into nothing, but kind of dissolving into infinite components that are infinitely interconnected. Does that, does that make sense? And so it's almost like the spaciousness and the clarity starts to have this aspect of not by itselfness, right? And when there's a not by itselfness feeling, the eye gives up the sense of needing to be so prominent, so dominant, so true, which relaxes you. Did you get lost or did you have ideas? If we, if we could feel the subtle consciousness, mm. like uh, yogi is, uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, condition by the aggregate. It continues even after the, the form is uh, dead and all. So how does how it relates to what we're talking about. Maybe the eye is this subtle consciousness. No, it, but that's close. And that's uh, some of the tenant schools stop there and they say, oh, the self is the fundamental consciousness. No problem, done, <laughs> right? The middle way consequence school says it's still just part of the basis. The, the aggregates don't disappear at death. They just kind of become dormant. Yeah, and all that is operating, all that is active is the fundamental consciousness, the clear light mind. So the clear light mind carries karma. It doesn't get rid of its karma when it dies. It just carries those seeds, but the seeds haven't sprouted. So it's like, you know, just like a little charged up consciousness ready to blossom into a whole life of experience again. But in between lives, it becomes a much more subtle, much more primarily mental experience. There still is a form aggregate, nominally speaking, which is the subtle energy wind that the consciousness rides on, life to life in the bardo. That subtle wind, you know, some uh, Chinese medicine would call it qi, is within the body right now. Like right now, the consciousness is riding on it also. It's just contained within the physical body most of the time. Then when we die, it exits. Yeah. So that extremely fundamental consciousness is definitely like colored by or conditioned by the activity of the aggregates. But then, you know, it just kind of like absorbs them. And all that is left is kind of mere experience. And that is still changing moment to moment. That still has many causes and conditions. That still has parts, you know, the first part, the second part, the third part. And that still is merely labeled by the mind. So that extremely fundamental consciousness is still empty of an inherent existence because it dependently arises but it seems like it might be that one, right? It seems like the self might be that one, but still even that one is not core. It's just, you know, in a sense, that's a good place to rest because it's certainly been there for beginningless time, but it is like a river changing all the time. So to say, that is it, I found the self is like pointing to one part of the river and saying that you have the whole river, you know, when it's just like a droplet that just moved by the time you pointed to it. Yeah, but yeah, some of the tenant schools do rest there and say the fundamental consciousness inherently exists and everything else doesn't. And the mind only school starts to go to that direction for sure. Yeah, it's interesting to explore. Look, you know, when you're walking around in your daily life, the thing to ask yourself is, who needs to prove anything? What is it that needs to be protected? What's at war? What wants peace? Who is it? Yeah? And you, you look for that one. You know, who is it that feels too feminine or too masculine? 
who is the one that feels too fat or too thin or too strong or too weak, or who is the one that feels too much something and is then kind of defensive or proud? Who is that one? Because that one is not there, right? But identification with it makes you unbearable to live with, right? <laughs> or identification with it is the core of conflict. Identification with it is what creates isolation and fear and suspicion and othering and war, you know? So this is at the heart of what's happening every day for us. And if we don't kind of get a handle on our own mistaken idea of self, we will keep othering people. And as soon as you other them, they're objects. They're objects to support you or they're, they're objects that hurt you. And you want them closer or you want them away. And the whole mess just keeps going. So you have to find your place in the mess so that we don't keep making the chaos of the world worse. We can, anytime we're touching the complete interdependence of things and the complete absence of an intrinsic identity, we're relaxing our little part of the universe and we're bringing peace to it. And then, you know, compassion becomes inevitable because it's the only thing that makes sense under the light of interdependence. Why so it's, mm, yeah, sorry? Why do you think that? The only thing that left is the uh, compassion. Can you explain, elaborate? Well, compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, right? Okay. What is it? What is it that makes us okay with other people suffering, <laughs> or want other people to suffer? It's thinking that they're different to us and that they're hurting us. And so, if they're hurting us, we don't mind if they're hurting. If they're threatening us, we don't mind if they're feeling scared. If you're understanding interdependence, then the natural response is everything is connected. So if you suffer, I suffer. I don't want you to suffer. I don't want me to suffer. Wishing freedom from suffering is compassion, right? So, you know, if you're right hand is hurting, you know, this example I use all the time, your left hand doesn't get jealous at the attention the right hand gets when it's hurting. The left hand will even come and like soothe it and say, are you okay? You okay? You know, and then once this hand is healthy, it doesn't then say I was entitled to that and I own this whole half of the body and you should always help me. And this hand doesn't say, I resent always helping you. What's wrong with you? You never help me. It's nonsense, right? Because it's a system. And it's an interconnected system. But we view each other as if we're distinct entities unrelated to each other when we're as connected as the right hand and the left hand. There are two things. You can say right hand, left hand, but they're all completely connected to each other. The health of one reinforces the health of the other. And then when you try and say, where is the hand? You point. You're pointing to a part. It's the palm or the fingers, right? So there is nothing there even that you've become obsessed with story about. So we have to remember interdependence. It's in our own best interest. We have to remember interdependence because it's also true and reality. And we become dysfunctional every time we forget it. Yeah, so you're releasing identity into kind of the network of interdependence while still recognizing that from a distance you can say this is me and I have responsibility over this section of the universe but it's so infinitely interconnected to say that that is something that has a very clear boundary is an exaggeration because yeah first of all sometimes you can find a person that suffers so much from one of his hands that he clearly wants to get rid of it. Yeah. Because if you can't take care of it, sometimes you want to take it Cut it out. And I think a lot of people wanting to disconnect is because they feel connected. So you want to disconnect someone that makes you miserable. Yeah. Control it. So I don't think that it's from not understanding connection. 
It's misunderstanding connection, though, because there's still an idea that you could disconnect if you wanted to, and you can't. It's like if this hand had cancer and it was spreading through the whole body, you could cut it off. Maybe it would help. But life isn't actually like that. That's the thing is like our, our confusion is about either not realizing interconnection or misunderstanding interconnection and thinking we could carve out certain places and just be interconnected over here and push away all those other bits that we don't want to be connected to. We are, whether we're liking it or not. We are connected, whether we like it or not. So might as well work for the health of the whole. You know, it's a, it's a misunderstanding from a few different angles, but the recognition that there is no escape from each other. There's, there is escape from harming oneself. There's escape from harming others, but only if you realize the lack of identity inherent identity and you can still acknowledge that you have one you can still say i am this and i am that and i am this and i'm that but that is not unrelated to context and that's not something that is of primary importance or true in and of itself you know it's like how to kind of yeah, I mean, you know, talk amongst yourselves, but wouldn't life be better if there was less identification with things that weren't true anyway from their own side, right? They're true, but not from their own side. So anyway, so sit with it, um, we'll dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever call ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power, and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> See you soon. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>